Welcome to this lecture in mechanical operations. We are kind of getting towards the end of the course. One of the mechanical operations that is used again in virtually all process industries is drying. Drying of solids is, a, is something that is usually done at the end of a process because solid materials are frequently processed as suspensions in fluids, especially liquids, but usually they have to be presented at the end of the process as a dry product, you know, whether you are making powders or, or crystals or pellets. Ultimately, the customer wants to see the material in a dried form. And so drying is a, a very important step in any process. Now, if you look at how drying is accomplished in general, and again, I like to go back to how we do things at home. You know, if you have a wet cloth, you know, the first thing you do is wring it out, right? So mechanical wringing or pressing or compression is actually a very effective way to get moisture, particularly out of sheets of material. The other mechanism, of course, is thermal. The most common way of drying any material is to apply heat to it, and uh, the heat transfer really controls the rate at which drying happens. So if you look at, again, a clothes dryer, it, it uses a combination of tumbling and hot air to, to remove moisture from clothes. So these are the, the mechanical drying and thermal drying are the two most common forms of drying. Sometimes you can also apply vacuum. Vacuum is a, an enhancer in the sense that it speeds up the drying process. It enables you to suck out moisture and present it so to the surface so that it can be removed from the surface. Uh, it's particularly useful for porous materials. Now, when you talk about drying, there are really two stages to it. One is the surface drying, the, um, the sensible moisture or surface moisture must be removed. But then if you have particularly again porous materials, the moisture would have permeated all the way down to the core and it will slowly start coming out to the surface and that has to be removed as well. There is a condition called bone dry which is where the entire solid is completely devoid of moisture. So that is the surface plus the subsurface plus the, um, the core area. Again, there are two ways in which drying can be accomplished. One is uh, what we call a direct method and the other is indirect method. In, a, in the direct method, heat or whatever the energy is, is supplied directly to the material that you are trying to dry, whereas in indirect drying, the heat is supplied to a surface which then contacts the material. So for example, you could have solid materials riding on, on a you know, carrier or conveyor and the conveyor bottom surface may be heated using some, some source of heat like condensing steam and the drying then happens because the heat is conducted from one side of the metal to the other side of the metal. Clearly direct drying, which is also called adiabatic drying compared to indirect or non-adiabatic drying is obviously a lot more effective in terms of directly conveying the heat to the material, but there are reasons you wouldn't want to do it. A lot of it has to do with the fact that um, you don't want to contaminate the product, for example. If you have a very clean product and you blow hot air on it, the, the contaminants in the air can then transfer to the material. And as we have seen before, a, a wet material has capillary forces. So if you, if you have a, a material in a wet condition and you blow dirt on it and then you dry it, it's going to be very, very difficult to remove that dirt afterwards because it's, it's been solid bridged to the material. So it's very important to avoid any form of contamination during the uh, drying process. So in, in terms of the adiabatic drying or contact drying or direct drying, there are basically five ways in which you can do it. One is called uh, cross flow drying where the product is either stationary or moving slowly and a hot medium such as a hot gas is blown across the face of the solid. That's called cross flow drying. 
through flow drying is where you have the material packed in a column and the hot gas passes through this column in some fashion. A, a variation of that is a packed bed drying, something that is analogous to what we have talked about earlier, you know, a packed bed where there is a fluid in interaction with, um, with a solid bed. So you could actually take the material that you are trying to dry, pack a bed with it and then pass hot gas through the bed. And of course the extension of that is a fluidized bed. If the velocity of the hot gas gets to be high enough, it can entrain the particles in the fixed bed and, um, and dry. And the fifth case is if the superficial velocity exceeds the settling velocity in a fluidized column, you can actually entrain the particles in the hot gas. So it is kind of a, if you want to simultaneously do drying and transport of the particles to the next step in the process, a fluidized bed that operates above the, um, the critical fluidization velocity could accomplish both simultaneously. So these are the five major variants in uh, direct or contact drying. Whereas in the case of non-contact drying, you know the, the situation is either the, the, the particles that are drying are just sitting on a bed which is heated in, in some way so that the heat is conveyed to the solid directly or it is being moved in a fashion, uh, usually a horizontal manner through a, for example, you could have an, a, a, a tunnel that the, the material passes through and the tunnel could have outlets or sprays that, are, that uh, blow hot air on the material as it drives through the tunnel. So that is another way you can do it or you can do gravity feed. You can have inclines that the solid slides down on and as it slides down, the slide itself is heated or and, and the heat is then conveyed to the, to the material that is sliding on the slide. So these are kind of some of the conventional ways in which indirect drying happens. But you now to go back to the, um, the direct drying, what you are really trying to do is apply heat to the material until it dries completely, right. So typically in a batch dryer, the temperature will be ramped to some value and then held constant at that value. But the material itself will take some time to, to warm up and until it reaches the vaporization temperature. And once you reach the vaporization temperature, the sensible moisture will start to evaporate and you would essentially the temperature would remain constant until you have completely evaporated all the material. And after that, the, the heat will again start transferring to the solid material from which you have removed the moisture. So if you look at a typical temperature profile in a dryer, if this axis is time, the hot gas temperature is typically held constant. The product or the solid temperature will rise from an initial value of T S capital T S A to a vaporization temperature at which point it will remain constant and then it will rise again to a final solids temperature T S B. So if you look at how the evaporation process is happening here, there are several stage, stages in this. First, there is a stage where the solid is getting heated to the, to the vaporization temperature and then the vaporization is happening at temperature TV and then that the solids are finally being raised to their outlet temperature or exit temperature of TSB and some of the vaporized material are also getting heated to a final temperature. So you get superheated vapor. So if you look at the total heat that you have to supply to the system, you call that some QT and you take the ratio of that to the flow rate or feed rate of mass through the system. This turns out to be composed of CPS which is the heat capacity constant pressure of the solid times TV or actually TSB minus TSA. So the total 
difference in the temperature of the solid from the entry point to the exit point plus CPL which is the heat capacity of the liquid times X let us call that XA which is the moisture mass fraction in the feed solid as a fraction of total weight of the bone dry solid let us call that some XA times TPL times TV minus TSA plus XB times CPL times TSB minus TV. So this is a heat that is being consumed by the liquid as the temperature first transitions from uh, TSA to the vaporization temperature TV and then from TV to TSB plus of course there is a heat of vaporization as well which you can write as XA minus XB times latent heat of vaporization lambda plus there is one more term which is the superheating term XA minus XB times CP times TVB minus TV which is the, the heat that is consumed as the vapor absorbs the heat to go from the vaporization temperature to the final temperature. So this is the kind of the overall cycle of heating that happens in a dryer and each of these stages the relative magnitude can be different depending on the material that you are trying to dry and depending on the um, configuration of the, of the dryer itself. Now the QT itself the heat that you are supplying can be written as some heat transfer coefficient U times uh, area times an average temperature differential that you are trying to achieve it could be a log mean temperature differential or other temperature means depending on what is appropriate for the situation. Sometimes this A the heat transfer area can be very difficult to estimate in a dryer and in that case you would use a volumetric heat transfer coefficient times V times delta T bar. Sometimes the, the volumetric the volume of contact is much easier to determine than the area of contact. So in that case you would use a, a volumetric heat transfer coefficient and multiply that by the volume of uh, the contacting system that you are using. So this is generally how heat transfer happens and provides heat for drying to happen. Now if you look at commercial systems for drying again they can be classified as systems that deal essentially with the paste and solid powders with moisture versus systems that deal with slurries particularly if you look at drying systems that treat with slurries the most common form of drying is spray drying. In a spray dryer what you have is a nozzle which takes this slurry and aerosolizes it and it introduces the aerosol into a column. So in the, in the most common case of a spray dryer for suspensions you essentially have a set of nozzles that introduce that take the liquid as feed does the slurry as feed and aerosolize it into fine droplets. The reason for doing that is the burning rate of a droplet scales as its size. So the uh, or the burning time for a droplet scales as square of the size. So as you minimize the size of the droplet it burns much faster. So the finer the nozzle the faster the burning of the, of the liquid can happen. Now what you do is in this case um, as you introduce a slurry through the top you can introduce hot gas through the bottom and when you do that this is called a counter current spray dryer where the material that you are trying to dry is being introduced to the top 
and the, and the hot gas that supplies the heat is being supplied through the bottom or the hot gas can also be introduced uh, along with the fee, along with the aerosols, I mean along with the suspension at the top and this is called a co-current spray dryer and there are different reasons for, for using the two different configurations. A, a big challenge here is that as the particles dry, they tend to migrate towards the walls and deposit. So you get loss of material because of transport towards the, the two side walls. And that is something you have to avoid and there are techniques that people use. Obviously the nozzle configuration is one way to control that. Another way is to actually coat the, the sides of the spray dryer chamber with low surface energy materials. As we have seen before in other lectures, if you want to minimize adhesion of a particle to a surface, you reduce its surface energy. So very simply you can conceive of a spray dryer where the walls are coated with Teflon for example. That will prevent dried particles from sticking there and they will be re-entrained into the gas stream. Now typically the collection points will be somewhere in the middle where the gas meets the particles. So the other conceivable problem you could have in a spray dryer is that if you, if the droplet size becomes too small and if your gas velocities are high enough, they will just keep getting entrained and they will keep recirculating in this section and never make it out. So even though there are big advantages to making very fine droplets, there are certain disadvantages as well. One of the key things that we look at as an output parameter from a spray dryer is the size distribution. You want the dried material to have a very tight size distribution. And also you want its um, bulk density to be very well controlled. Some products that are made using spray dryers are detergents, right? Again, common household detergents. When you use a detergent, the thing that you like to see is that you get very uniform cleaning action, right? From load to load. Now, there are ways you can make nano detergents. So you are, the detergent pack that you get in this size now, you could get the same detergency in a pack that's about this big if you go to nano kind of detergent powders. But there are two problems with that. One is again controlling the particle size, controlling the quality, the purity and so on and preventing agglomeration. The second is more user perception. You know, when you pay so much money, you want to see a big box of detergent. And uh, so in fact, the industry has been kind of looking into going to smarter detergents, but so far there's been quite a bit of consumer resistance. People like to see detergents in a certain way. Another product that's made uh, using this is actually coffee powder, particularly the, the instant or freeze dried or all those types of powders that you see are made using the, the same spray drying process. So spray dryers are really workhorses as far as drying of uh, suspensions is concerned. Now as far as drying of uh, you know solids and solids with a bit of liquid or, or paste, there are different techniques that, um, that, that you can use. One of the common techniques is, is simply tray drying. So you would have an oven and you will have trays mounted in it and you will place solids in each, in each tray, turn on the oven for a set period of time and the material will get dry. So this is a typical batch dryer for solids and the drying is done just by providing heat and um, you know leaving the solids in until they completely dry out. And this can sometimes be also enhanced with some gas circulation. So instead of just heated trays, which is a, an indirect drying mechanism, you can simultaneously circulate hot gas through this oven. It's called a convection oven. As opposed to a static oven, a convection oven has more hot air recirculation inside the chamber, which will promote drying. And there are also vacuum ovens. Applying a vacuum can also enhance the rate at which uh, drying happens. But all of these types of um, tray dryers or oven dryers rely upon very uniform heating of the material that you have in, in the dryer. And that can sometimes be problematic because you know depending on the 
the pattern of moisture leaving the, the solids and getting mixed in with the airstream and the pattern in which the hot gas itself is circulating, you may get good drying in certain locations but the, the drying may be inadequate in certain locations. So that is usually a, a problem with any type of particularly a con, uh, an oven type of dryer where the pots are static and if you do not have hot gas circulating, you are relying upon heating. The heating can happen very uniformly but once the moisture leaves the pot, it is hard to predict how it is going to circulate within the chamber and recondense and so on. So that is one of the, the downsides. So an extension of a, a tray dryer is what is called a tower dryer. In a tower dryer, it is very similar. You have you know trays of pots loaded but the whole configuration is cylindrical. So uh, the pots are mounted on a tray on, on, a, on an axis which actually rotates and that gives you more uniform temperature distribution and more uniform drying inside the drying chamber and an extension of that is basically a like a tumbling dryer. The same concept that we had previously described for size reduction, if you do not use any media, you can actually use it very effectively for removal of particles as well, a tumble dryer with hot, hot gas being flown through the chamber. So that again can give you fairly uniform drying of material. The only thing of course in this case is you cannot use this process for fragile materials that can actually damaged by contact you know falling contact with each other and so on. But if you do not have those to worry about then it is a good process tumble dryers are again used in laundromats all the time and you know that they are very effective. In a laundromat a dryer basically works by tumbling clothes while hot air is passed through and that is a pretty effective way of drying. Another method of drying that is commonly used is what is called flash drying. This is particularly useful for materials that cannot withstand long exposure to hot temp high temperatures but which can be heated uh, for shorter times to higher temperatures. So in a flash heater you supply extreme heat to the point where you are well above the vaporization temperature for the liquid and it causes drying to happen within a matter of seconds. So it is particularly useful for materials that are sensitive to prolonged exposure to heat and also where you need to shorten the cycle time quite drastically, flash dryers are widely employed. The other types of uh, dryers are again what we have discussed in the, in the previous segment of, uh, of the course, fixed beds and fluidized beds. They can also be used quite effectively as, um, as drying mechanisms. So you know, in general when you are trying to choose a dryer what do you base it on? Again it, it first thing it, go, it goes back to what condition do you need the product in, what are the things that your feed material is sensitive to, what are your constraints as far as energy is concerned, as far as cost is concerned, as far as time is concerned and then you have fairly large variety of drying systems to, to choose from and they do not overlap too much. So it is almost like for every application you can pick one system that is fairly optimized for what you are trying to do. It is also important to have measurement capability. So moisture sensors are frequently deployed in drying systems to look at how moisture levels are evolving as a function of time. Once you reach a certain steady state of moisture level in your chamber, you pretty much know you are not going to get much more drying and so either you have to take the product out and put it in another chamber, drying chamber to do more drying or that is going to be your steady state moisture. In fact, if you look at moisture in solids, the, there is something called free moisture. Free moisture is if you take the total moisture content that the solids enter with and the equilibrium moisture content that the solids leave with, the difference between the two is called free moisture. This free moisture is something you can, you can never remove from the solid in the particular dryer that you are using because there is going to be an equilibrium moisture level you cannot go below because of constraints in the design of your chamber. So for example, unless your free moisture content is 0, you can never achieve a bone dry solid. 
So what you do is typically in industry you use multi-stage drying. So you will take a really wet solid, get it down to a certain level of dryness using certain gross drying systems such as tumbling and, and um, heating and so on. But if you, if you have to re remove the last layer of moisture, if your free moisture has to be virtually 0, then you have to supplement it with some precision drying techniques. Vacuum is one way to do it. Vacuum dryers are capable of removing even the last mono layer of solid. The other type of dryers that are used in that situation are what are called displacement dryers. You can take a solvent and use that to displace water from the chamber, I mean from the material and then the solvent itself will vaporize. Alcohols are, are quite frequently used, many organic solvents are used for this purpose. Uh, but IPA, isopropyl alcohol is an excellent displacer of water. And so if you take a dry surface and you expose it to uh, I, uh, IPA vapor, the IPA vapor will displace the water. So the water vapor will remove from, will move from the surface and then the IPA itself will also evaporate over time. So if you want to get bone dry cleanliness or what is known as spot free dryness of a, of a surface then these types of uh, displacement drying systems are also very useful. Of course other techniques that are used are things like laser drying. If you have an extremely moisture sensitive surface and you need to or material and you need to remove every trace of it, you can bombard the surface with high energy. It could be a plasma dryer, it could be a laser dryer but something that provides sufficient thermal activation to the surface that you can boil the, the water off the surface and also induce sufficient vibration in the surface to shake off the last layer of moisture that, that may be sitting on the surface. So uh, these types of drying systems of course they are more expensive, capital cost can be much higher but if you are trying to make particularly in pharma industry you might have seen that certain medicines are packed with desiccants in order to ensure that the moisture remains under control. So for such materials it is also important that they be manufactured with controlled humidity and in such cases people are willing to invest in fairly sophisticated drying systems to, to make that happen. Desiccants of course are another way of drying but desiccants are particularly used for storage and shipping right. You might have received product from various places that have desiccant packs that are packed along with the product but they can also be used for drying. A desiccant is basically a, a, a gel that can adsorb or absorb moisture very effectively. And so if you are trying to get a material dry, you can actually surround it with desiccant packs which can absorb the moisture that is being released from the part. And so you can use it as a drying method in addition to using it to keep the components or keep the material dry during shipping and storage. Now if you look at drying as a process, it is, it involves heat transfer but it also involves mass transfer right because what, what is happening is water or moisture is a mass that is attached to your dry material and you are trying to separate the two. So you are trying to transfer the moisture mass from the solid into a gas typically uh, which will carry that away. So you also have to look at it as a mass transfer problem. And when you look at it that way, the, um, the mass transfer situation is um, very analogous to the heat transfer situation. Uh, what happens is initially the mass transfer happens from the surface of the solid that you are trying to dry and then eventually you start involving the subsurface mass and the core mass as the heat that you are supplying penetrates to the subsurface and, and core areas. So if you, if you actually look at how drying happens, again if you plot time versus moisture content, the moisture content will drop over time right as you are doing the drying and it will drop to its um, equilibrium value which may not be 0. So this is your moisture content x let us say. If you look at the drying rate that is associated with this process that has a form that looks like this. There is an initial increase in the drying rate 
and then it is fairly constant over a long period of time and then it drops to 0 as this asymptotes out. So, this is R which is the rate of drying. The rate of drying has two important characteristics. This is called the constant rate period and this part is called the falling rate period. In a typical drying process the constant rate period can be a very long period or it can be very short also depending on the energy that you are supplying and the nature of the material and the nature of the drying equipment and so on. But what is happening mechanistically in the constant rate period is there is sufficient quantity of moisture on the outer periphery of the solid that its rate of vaporization is independent of the rate at which the moisture is being replenished by diffusion from the interior of the solid material. So, it is this is the constant rate period is one which is dominated by the equilibrium between the drying fluid that you are using and the moisture that is sitting on top of the surface. There is always sufficient supply of moisture on the surface that its availability never becomes a rate limiting factor. What happens in the falling rate period is all the surface moisture a lot of it has been removed and the rate at which vaporization is happening on the surface is not being matched by the rate at which the moisture is being replenished by diffusion from pores and, and so on. Actually there are two mechanisms that can bring moisture from the subsurface to the surface. One is diffusion, the other is capillary action. A typical solid will have pores which extend to various lengths. Uh, we, have, we had sketched the subsurface earlier in one of the lectures and you know that the capillaries are can be of different shapes, different sizes, they can be differently interlinked and so on. So, the process by which moisture comes out from the bulk of the particle to its surface will very much depend on the distribution of these capillaries that link the subsurface to the surface. And so, the rate at which drying happens can be very different once you get into this period and it will depend very much on the distribution of pores within the solid. Now, if the initial moisture level on the part is below the level at which this can happen, you can have a falling rate period right from the beginning. In other words, if you have a reasonably dry solid and so the, the, the rate at which moisture evaporates from the surface is less than the rate at which moisture is being supplied to the surface, then you may never see this constant rate happening. On the other hand, if you have a, a solid that is absolutely non-porous and all the moisture is restricted to the surface region, you can also have a situation where the constant rate period extends all the way till the end of the drying process and the falling rate period is never experienced. So, depending on which of these two situations applies, you can be have one extreme or the other, but most likely a drying process will show this type of behavior and the total drying time will be a combination of the total time for the constant period plus time for the falling period. And if you are trying to optimize your drying cycle, the rate at which drying happens to through the during the constant drying period is pretty much as I said a surface phenomenon. So, if you want to minimize the time that, that takes during the constant drying period, then you really have to focus on your source of energy and how that source or how that energy is being supplied to the surface. So, the, the external mechanics is what you need to focus on. On the other hand, if you want to minimize the time during the falling period or if you want to increase the rate of drying during the falling rate period, then you should focus more on the interior drying dynamics of the solids that, that you are trying to dry. Another example is you know a, a single solid may be non-porous, but if you are now packing them in a bed and you are trying to dry an entire bed of solids, then the porosity in the bed itself becomes a parameter. 
So even though the individual particles may have no porosity, once you pack them into a powder or a bed or whatever, there is porosity that is now introduced into this collection of solids. And as you know, we are never going to be drying one solid at a time, right? So you are always going to be dealing with a population of solids. In that case, um, what you really care about is some of the things that, that we talked about in when we are talking about particularly flow of fluids past single particles versus beds of particles. You really have to be aware of the flow dynamics and how hot gas is being flowed through the packed bed. And um, again, it is more important to do this during this part of it. The other aspect of all this is of course the, the equilibrium that exists between the drying gas and the solid. Drying is, is not usually a, um, a rate limited process because usually you provide sufficient heat. Typically you, you try to heat the solid to a temperature above the vaporization temperature of the liquid. So uh, the thermodynamics or the phase equilibria are usually in favor of the drying process. What you have to try and optimize then is the A the heat transfer process and B the mass transfer process. Again the point is heat transfer is more important to optimize during the constant rate period and mass transfer is more important to optimize during the falling rate period. Momentum transfer or, or you know the fluid mixing with the particles is also an important phenomenon particularly when you have packed beds that have distributed porosities. In order to make sure that drying happens uniformly and equally across the bed of solids, you have to ensure that you deliver the, uh, the fluid in such a way that you get equal exposure of all the solids that are in your system. And that is where you know fixed bed does not work as well as a fluidized bed. The particle to fluid contact can be much greater in a fluidized bed compared to a fixed bed. And so particularly for drying applications, fluidized beds are, are applied much more commonly than packed pack beds or fixed beds. Okay, so let us stop our discussion of uh, drying at that point. Do you have any questions? Okay.